Well, 2018 was a horrific year for the Catholic Church with the summer of shame and all the scandals beginning here in America with Cardinal, ex-Cardinal McCarrick and scandals all the way into the walls of the Vatican. And 2019 will most likely be a similar year with more revelations. And there have been hundreds of people who have been writing me, emailing me, tweeting me saying, what do we do as Catholic lay people? How do we fight this battle, this war? Do we withhold money at the collection? Do we write letters to our bishops? Do we tweet our bishops? What do we do? Those are all reactive strategies. There's a place for them. But the most powerful strategies in a battle, in a war, are proactive strategies. And so today, I'm going to lay out those proactive strategies for the Catholic layperson in 2019. I'm going to do it with St. Thomas Aquinas in his Theology of Goals. Now, a lot of people are for and against New Year's goals. I'm going to take this opportunity to be in favor of goals but I'm not going to do it in the cheesy, lame way that most people at New Year's write down and practice goals because over 90% of the time, those fail. And I'm going to explain to you philosophically why people fail in their New Year's goals. And I'm going to do it with Thomas Aquinas in his Theology of Teleology, literally the study of goals, the study of ends. I wrote my PhD dissertation on a topic related to the teleology of the human person in St. Thomas Aquinas as it relates to natural law. We're not doing that today, but we are going to talk about goals. Then we're going to explain why people miss their goals. And then at the end, I'm going to give you goals for the new year to wage this battle, not against human persons, but against demonic forces, the principalities, as St. Paul calls them. And I'm going to lay out for you the classic, traditional Catholic piety, the plan of life for daily goals, weekly goals, monthly goals, and yearly goals, all right? So that'll get us through the whole year. It'll be a proactive battle, not a reactive battle, which is really just playing a defense. Okay, so what are goals according to Thomas Aquinas? Now, Thomas Aquinas has what are called the four causes. This is a very important philosophical principle. Every Catholic layperson needs to understand this. I have a whole class and coursework on it in the New St. Thomas Institute. That's newstthomas.com if you want to learn more. But I'm going to lay it out for you here in a mini version. The four causes, according to Thomas Aquinas, are the formal cause, the material cause, the efficient cause, and the final cause. Okay, and I'm going to use the example of a squirrel to help you understand these four causes. So first off, the formal cause tells you what a thing is. And, and Thomas Aquinas is deriving this a lot from Aristotle, but you don't need to know all those details. What you do need to know is the formal cause is what defines what a thing is. In the case of a squirrel, it's what makes an animal a squirrel and not a rose bush not a horse, not a cat or a dog, but a squirrel. It defines squirrelness. That's the form. The matter, the material cause, is what the squirrel is made out of. If I had a squirrel here, here and it was, we killed it and we chopped it all up, which would be gross, but if we did that, we would have all the matter of the squirrel, the skeleton, the skin, the fur, the bones, all the stuff, that the squirrel is made of, but it wouldn't really be a squirrel anymore. The form, what makes it a squirrel running around burying nuts has now been removed. It's life. If you wanted to call it even its life force, Thomas would actually call it a soul, but not a rational soul. Like we understand our souls. It's been stripped away. So that's the matter. So we have the formal cause. What is a squirrel? The material cause, what's it made out of? And then the efficient cause, which is what set it into motion. Now, the proximate cause, the nearest efficient cause to that squirrel would be the squirrel's parents, the mommy and daddy squirrel that came together, procreated, and conceived this particular squirrel. But remotely, all the way back, we know as Catholics that the efficient cause of the squirrels was God himself who created the squirrel. All right, so we, so far we've done formal cause, material cause, efficient cause. Our final one is the one that we want to focus on today, the final cause, and that is the goal of a squirrel. What is the finality? 
What is the purpose? What is the meaning of life for a squirrel? Now, ultimately, like all animals, the squirrel is here to eat food and drink water to keep itself alive and to procreate, to make more squirrels. And they've been doing this for thousands of years. That's what squirrels do. That's their purpose, their goal. But in God's general plan in creation, the animal kingdom and the vegetable kingdom, they have goals, purposes built into them. Just take, for example, the squirrel. He goes before winter and he buries hundreds of nuts into the ground to preserve them so he can eat them during winter. And let's say a squirrel, I don't, I don't know, he buries 500 nuts in the ground. Well, over winter, maybe he goes and he digs up and finds 300 of those nuts. Well, 200 of those nuts have now been buried and will turn into a pecan tree or an oak tree or whatever kind of tree the squirrel uh, is burying the nuts for. And that serves a purpose in God's creation. Whether the squirrel knows it or not, of course he doesn't. But by him burying nuts for him to eat, which is part of his final causality, he's also serving a greater causality in creation. The same thing happens, for example, with uh, bees. Bees are making food, eating food, and procreating, but yet they're also producing honey, which is food for other animals and for humans, and wax, which we humans use as well. So everything in nature is serving both a, a final cause like eating and, and procreating, but also has a greater purpose in this giant you know, circle of life. But when it comes to humans, our final causality is transcendent. It is different. We're not here just to make honey or wax or to bury nuts. It's true, we humans have to eat and drink to stay alive, and we have to procreate or the human race will fall away. But we also have a purpose in this universe that governs everything that's created, just as God had placed Adam and Eve over the created order, not as despots, not to abuse it, but to care for it, to till it. And also, here's the big one, folks, to communicate directly with God, to have a relationship with God, to be elevated and become like God. We, unlike the squirrel, are in the image of God, and we are called to attain the likeness of God, as we read in the Eastern Church Fathers, and Thomas Aquinas states this as well. So our goals are related to a final goal, which is the beatific vision to see God face to face, that our intellect will be attached to, will participate in the divine essence of God, the mind of God. We don't become gods equal to God, but we do become what Thomas Aquinas calls deiform. We become in the form of God. We become to the likeness of God so that we can experience God in a personal and eternal way. That is the number one goal for every human person. That is why God created us. Really, that's why God created the whole universe was so that the rational agents, which are angels and humans, would turn to him in an expression of love and be united to him forever and ever. And so once we establish that for the human person, and by the way, the atheists don't have this, it's cut off from them. We Catholics know it to be true that our ultimate goal, capital G, is to enter the beatific vision, to go to heaven and to be happy with him forever. And so what that tells us as humans is we have to order our life with dozens, hundreds, thousands, maybe even millions of goals in our life in order to attain that final goal. So you can see already we're not just doing you know cheesy New Year's resolutions and goals. We are getting to the very heart of the matter of what it means to be a person. To be a human person is to have the goal of God, have the goal of the beatific vision, the goal of heaven, everlasting life in Christ, in the Holy, in the, in the Holy Trinity, experiencing perfect beatitude forever with who we are as persons. And as Catholics, we also know it involves the resurrection of the dead. Again, we don't have to go into that right now. So if that's our goal, we have to make goals to get to the goal. Okay, we have to make goals, thousands of goals to get to that goal. Here's some examples. Uh, you were not raised Catholic. You study, you learn, maybe you hear preaching, you go to a mission or a missionary comes to your place 
and they tell you the gospel. You hear about Christ and how he died for our sins. You, you learn the Apostles' Creed, and you say, I want this everlasting life. Therefore, you make goals. I will sign up to take classes. I will register myself as a catechumen. I will set every week time to go to the catechism classes. And I will, sign, I will sign up and attend and receive baptism and confirmation and the Eucharist. Congratulations. You're now a Catholic. You still have hundreds of goals more, don't you? You now say, I'm going to schedule out of my life every Sunday as a hallowed day, and I will attend Mass. I will go and observe the Eucharistic liturgy, and ideally, if I'm a state of, state of grace, receive the Eucharist. I will set time every month to go to confession. I will study books. I will read the Bible daily. I will pray the rosary daily. All of a sudden, by entering into the Catholic faith, by receiving the sacraments of initiation, you set yourself up for a number of other goals. And unfortunately, Catholic people in our time have never been taught this. People don't know that the sacraments open up more responsibility to you. You don't just get to check off the boxes of the sacraments. You get confirmed and then you're done. And maybe you check in at Christmas and Easter. No, you have followed the Messiah and he says, take up your cross and follow me. And this is a day by day responsibility, something we do all the time. And so we're going to look at what are those traditional goals of the saint, those before us, our forebears in the Catholic faith, who wanted to be serious disciples and followers of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, what did they do? What did their daily plan look like? What did their weekly plan and their monthly plan and their yearly plan look like? Before we do that, though, I just want to talk about why it is that most people who don't understand this philosophy of goals, why is it that they fail in their goals? And the reason is they don't do smart goals. And I did a blog post on this a few years ago. It was pretty popular. I did a webinar on it, and I'm just going to review it because I know there's a lot of new people uh, who haven't maybe seen my old blog post at taylormarshall.com or haven't been to the webinars. And SMART is an acronym, S-M-A-R-T. And in order to have a great goal, you have to follow these five criteria. The first one is S, and that means specific. You have to say what exactly you want to achieve. Generalities are setups for failure. So if you say on New Year's Day, I want to get into shape. I want to grow closer to God. Those are horrible goals. Not their intention. The intention's great. The goals themselves are horrible. You couldn't make a worse goal than saying, I just want to get closer to God this year, or I just want to be healthy this year because they are not specific. There is no way for you in your mind as a finite person to attain something as gen generic as closer to God or being healthy because we're constantly distracted, because of we are embodied, we live in this world. And so you must be specific. You must say, my goal this year is to lose exactly or more 15 pounds of fat. That's a good goal. It's very specific. It's laser specific. My goal this year is to go to the first Friday masses all year long. Extremely specific. Will you go closer to God? Yes. My goal this year is to read one chapter of the Bible every single day for 365 days. Laser specific. It's a good goal. If you don't have specificity, you're going to fail in the goal every single time. All right, the next one is M, and M is measurable. Can you measure the goal? It's really, are you doing it or are you not doing it? If you say, I want to read the Bible every day this year, at the end of January, you can say, how many times did I do it? 31 times. Great. I'm actually achieving my goal. 10 times. Okay, I am not achieving this goal for the year. Why is that? What do I do to fix it? You see, it has to be measurable. If you can't measure it, you're going to fail. The next one is A, and A stands for actionable. 
you should be able to perform a action to attain the goal, not a sentiment. This is the big problem. So an action would be drive to the gym, drive to the church, pull out the beads from your pocket or off your nightstand and pray five decades of the rosary. Hire a trainer at the gym. Go on a weekly date with my spouse. You see, these are all actions. They're not sentiments. They're not feelings. They're things that you must do. Because for Thomas Aquinas, the goals that we have, even the final goal, which is heaven, requires activity, not just faith. And this is where we get back to the Council of Trent and the Protestant Reformation. We Catholics have always believed in faith and works, belief and action. Without action, your faith is dead. That's James chapter two. So you must work. You must have actions. And if you're going to have a goal, it must be actionable. You must be able to do it. So if you, if you say, I just want to get really close with my wife and, and strengthen our marriage, it's a horrible goal. It's not specific, right? You need to get specific and you can't measure it. Three months from now, how do you measure? Am I closer to my spouse? Maybe you had a fight last night. How are you going to judge that? You can't. But if you say, I want to have a better relationship with my wife, more communication, get closer, more intimacy. Therefore, we're going to have a date every Friday night. We're going to set out and we're going to have sitters lined up. We're going to have a date every Friday night and make the effort, make the goal, do it. That's actionable. That's good. You have a chance, a strong chance now of attaining this goal. Now we're moving through SMART. Now we get to R. R is realistic. Now, some people are very unrealistic in their goals or in their New Year's resolutions. You know, they say, I want to get six pack abs by spring break. All right, maybe realistic, probably not, especially if you're, you know, 45 years old or you're very out of shape or overweight. Or, you know, if you said something like, I want to be uh, a major league baseball player by the end of the year, or I want to make a million dollars, or I want to run for Senate by the end of the year. Look, you have to be realistic. We have to know what our limits are. And again, I, I, if you listen to my podcast, I've always said, stretch yourself. Whatever you think you can do, add five or 10% to it. Go beyond, try it. If you fail, Hey, if you reach for the stars, you don't make it. Hey, you made it to the moon. That's good, right? So if you think you can make it to the moon, try to go a little bit beyond the moon and see what you can attain, all right? Just stretch yourself. And honestly, I'm really big on goals, guys. And I set them out. I write them down at the beginning of every year, and I consult them. I even have right here on the wall our goals right here. Should I take the camera? No, I won't move the camera because it'll mess it up. But I have goals on the wall, and I have a pencil right here, and I'm constantly writing notes and keeping track on all kinds of minutia. You'd probably be surprised on it, all right? So I'm big on the goals, and I think that we should we should stretch ourselves. And every year, I'm kind of surprised. I give thanks to God that sometimes I go way over goals. You know, I go 50% beyond. I was only aiming for five or 10, but you know what? The good choices just kept adding up, and it went way beyond. And you know what? I'm going to be real honest. I'd say probably depending on the year, 20 to 50% of my goals, I don't make them. I fail or just something happens. Uh, there's a sickness or a baby's born or whatever it is. And that goal just doesn't, doesn't make it. And that's okay. That's just being realistic. And that's R. And then the last one is T for smart. We've moved all the way. S-M-A-R-T. Time bound. Guess what? You're a human. You're inside time. Therefore, your goals must be time bound. If you don't put an end date on it, you're going to procrastinate. The interesting word, procrastination, pro means for, cras means tomorrow. So in Latin, pro cras, procrastination means for tomorrow, for tomorrow, for tomorrow, for tomorrow. And the way you stop that is you put an end date so that there's a time when you can't say for tomorrow. And I like to break, over time, I've learned to break up goals over months and quarters. So let's say I want to read the Bible this year. I want to read the Summa Theologiae this year, the whole thing. You have to break up all the pieces. And I put review points at the end of every month or every quarter, because if you just wait to review when you're in October or November, you may say, wow, I'm like 
half the Bible behind. There's no way I'm going to finish. But if you review yourself and you put time-bound markers at the months or the quarters or at the weeks, then you can say, oh, wow, I'm like three chapters behind the Bible. Uh, This Saturday, I'll read a little extra before bed and get caught up. Great. You're going to make your goal, right? Because you're time-bound in your goals. That is smart goals. Write it down, specific, measurable, actionable, realistic, and time-bound. And with all that stated, we've covered Thomas Aquinas, we've covered teleology, final goals, we de- we've determined what are good goals. I'm going to lay out for you a battle strategy for 2019. And again, this doesn't require you to do all of these. Maybe pick one, maybe pick five, I don't know. But these are the time-honored strategies for the Catholic saint, for the serious Christian, and there are probably some that I've missed. If I have, and they're good ones, put it in the comments, and we'll and we'll we'll add them in next year. So I'm going to begin with daily, and then I'm going to go to weekly, and then I'm going to go to monthly, and then annual goals for the Catholic. Ready? Okay, daily. If you watch my YouTube channel, if you listen to my podcast, you probably know what I'm going to say, and that is pray the rosary daily. The rosary is the gospel of Jesus Christ on beads. You're meditating on the life of Jesus Christ bead by bead. Yes, you pray the Our Father. Yes, you pray the Hail Mary. But more importantly, you meditate on the mysteries. So the coming of Gabriel, the incarnation in the womb of Mary, the visitation of Mary to Elizabeth, the birth of Jesus, all the way into the end with the assumption of Mary and the crowning of Mary in heaven by her son, Jesus Christ. This is a beautiful devotion. Our Lady of Fatima came down, the Blessed Virgin Mary came down in 1917, did the greatest miracle on earth since the crossing of the Red Sea, and the primary message for lay people was pray the rosary every single day. How do you do this? Well, you keep a rosary in your pocket, so when you're waiting at the doctor's office, you can do it. 15, 20 minutes uh, before church, after church, while you're driving, uh, maybe, maybe not, depends on on what kind of driving you're doing and what traffic is like, uh, before bed. Our family does it after dinner and before we put the little kids to bed. So around 8 o'clock or 8.30, we come together, we turn off the lights, and we pray the rosary. If you have a family It may not be attainable to do five decades, and that's okay. Do one, do two, do three, maybe do five. Um, But again, remember, part of the goals are being realistic. And then maybe during the day, you can fill in those those missing decades. For me, I know, just for example, yesterday, I was at Mass. uh, Before, around, during Mass, I prayed, I think, three decades. And then later on, during the day, pray a decade. And then with the family, pray a decade. So... You know, you get to five decades, you prayed the mysteries, but maybe, you know, for me, busy and kids and all that, it wasn't all in one, you know, beautiful mystical experience. You know what? Again, we go back to realistic. I do what I can. You got to be realistic. So pray the rosary every day. Also, examination of conscience every day. You might want to incorporate this with the rosary when you finish the rosary. Therefore, if you do the rosary in the evening, you examine your conscience. And the way you examine your conscience, I have a whole YouTube video on this, but you go through the seven deadly sins. Pale gas is the acronym I use. You can see that I use a lot of acronyms to remember stuff. Pride, anger, lust, envy, gluttony, avarice, and sloth. Quickly go through those seven. Again, I have a whole YouTube video on it. See my YouTube video, How to Make a Catholic Confession. And I talk about how to use the seven deadly sins as an examination of conscience. Super easy, super fast, pretty much fail-proof. Pride, anger, lust, envy, gluttony, avarice, sloth, pale gas, you've got it. Another daily devotion is the Angelus. Uh, It's done three times a day. If I'm honest with myself, I'm realistic. I don't do it three times a day. I usually aim for it at lunch. And I set a timer on my iPhone, 1155 to do the Angelus. I found if you put it at 12, you're already at lunch with someone or you're already at, you're into lunch and your phone goes off and you can't just tell the person, hey, can we stop and pray the Angelus while you're ordering your iced tea? It doesn't work so well, so I like to push it to 11.55. And then 
The number one daily devotion that I want to stress to everyone watching, drum roll please, is read the Bible every day. Read the Bible every single day. If you read three chapters a day, you will read the whole Bible during 2019. I'm going to give everybody watching a gift, and it is the New St. Thomas Institute, How to Read the Bible in a Year. We have broken down the entire Old Testament, including the seven Deuterocanonical books and the New Testament, into 365 readings every day. You get some Old Testament and you get some New Testament, so it keeps it fresh. And if you look in the show notes uh, underneath this video, I'll put the link there so that you can download that. It's usually just for our students, our members in the New St. Thomas Institute. But today for this uh, video, everybody can have it. So make sure you download that, print it out, and put it in your Bible. Put your Bible where you, wherever you're going to use it, in your backpack, in your briefcase, on your nightstand, and then make a goal of when you are going to do it. And I recommend that you do it at the same place in the same time every single day. For example, in the chair next to your bed at 9.30 p.m. Make it a habit, habituate yourself, and that goal will come true. You'll read the Bible. I've read the Bible several times through in a year. I once did the Bible twice in a year, so that's six chapters a day. You can do it. People read 30 novels a year. This book is only a little over 2,000 pages. You can read the Bible. You should read the Bible. Ignorance of Scripture is ignorance of Christ. Also, to help you for this, I'm giving you the worksheet. But at the New St. Thomas Institute, I've created two certificate programs, two curricula. One is called Catholic New Testament Studies. There's a video with me, just like this, but better with graphics and stuff, explaining to you every single book of the Bible in an HD video. So we do Matthew. There's several videos with Matthew, Mark, Luke, all the way through to Revelation, okay? Okay. It's a great resource because one of the biggest problems in doing new Bible studies, Bible reading, is getting confused, right? And then once you're confused, you don't really want to go back to it, and you just fall off. Also, in 2019, that's this year to come, the New St. Thomas Institute, we are putting out a new curriculum called Christ in the Old Testament. And I'm going through every single book of the Old Testament and giving you a Catholic introduction to it, but more importantly, explaining to you how Christ and the Catholic Church is already hidden and found in the Old Testament. So in Genesis, we talk about just the first video, for example, is how Adam and Eve are types of Christ and Mary, and how we as Catholics understand that connection, right? And then we go on and we talk about how the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph, are types of Jesus Christ and how Christ fulfills them. And then we go on, we talk about Moses and how he's a type of Christ. And the Red Sea is a type of baptism, literally going through the entire Old Testament. I'd like to invite you to join. It's the New St. Thomas Institute. It's the largest online Catholic institute in the world. We have seven going on eight curricula certificate uh, programs. And we have uh, I think currently over 3,000 students all over the world in about 60 nations. We have priests, we have deacons, we have nuns, but mostly we have laity, we have young moms, we have lawyers, businessmen, grandparents, even some teenagers, families using it for homeschool. This will take you step by step, book by book through the Old Testament. So print out the sheet, and then if you like, you can sign on to NewStThomas.com and get a membership. It's month to month. If you don't like it, you just quit. And the first, uh, I think uh, there's some guarantee. It's the first month or first 25 days. If you don't like it, we'll refund your money. So there's no risk to you. But our retention rate, it moves between 93 and 97%. People who sign on, they stay on. Why? Because they benefit. It's like you read the Bible and then Dr. Taylor Marshall comes along and says, hey, here's what Thomas Aquinas says about this passage, and here's what St. Basil says about this passage, and here's what St. Augustine says about this, and, and here's uh, what St. Bonaventure says about this, and the popes and the councils, bringing all of that to bear on the Bible. So again, this is a little bit of a pitch here, but if you want to study 
Catholic Biblical Studies, NewStThomas.com. Read the Bible every day. Okay, so that's the daily plan. The weekly plan, of course, is to go to Mass every Sunday, but to prepare. So this is a new one. In the old days, people would prepare the night before by sometimes they would pray Vespers, evening prayer. Sometimes they would pray extra rosary. They would always do a weekly examination of conscience. So you're doing one every day, but on Saturday night, you spend more time and you really cultivate and you think through the whole week, what have been my predominant sins for the past seven days since I last went to Mass on Sunday? I wonder why that is. How can next week be more holy? If I've been angry and lashing out at my spouse or my kids, how can next week be better? To do that before you receive the Eucharist on Sunday morning is a great goal. And um, also to preview the readings, maybe the prayers, get a good missal. I did a, a video on this before. I like the Father Lassant's missal. This is, of course, if you go to the Latin Mass, uh, 1962 Mass. This is actually a, a pre-1955 missal. But get a good missal, and the night before, look over the lessons. Find out what the saints' days are that week. Prepare yourself. Get in tune with the liturgical calendar. So that's the weekly goal. The monthly goal, the primary thing you got to do every month is confession. I really, there's so many saints, so many doctors of the church, so many good spiritual directors who will say you need to go to confession at least once a month. So the goal is 12 times a year. I shoot for two times a month or every other week. Do I always get it? No, sometimes it'll go a whole month. Sometimes maybe every once in a while it'll go five weeks. But usually during the year, it's every two weeks, every two weeks. And then of course, when we get close to like holy days, like Christmas and Easter and Pentecost, the Assumption, I like to go right before that just to be extra clean for those, those feast days. But making a plan to go at least once a month, and of course, whenever you have a mortal sin, Within 24 hours, you get yourself to confession, right? You don't waste time. We're not, we don't want to go to hell. We want to go to heaven, right? That means you have a giant gaping wound in your soul, and you need the doctor's attention, and that doctor is the priest. So you need sacramental absolution. But just to keep things up and to keep strong, monthly confession. Also, throw in something extra in the month. For example, I want to go to Eucharistic adoration once a month. You know, maybe sign up and take a slot. You know, if, you're, if your church does uh, all-night adoration, like on first Fridays or first Saturdays, say, you know what, I'm going to do that. I'm going to put the kids to bed, and I'm going to go do the 10 p.m. slot and adore my Lord at Eucharistic adoration. Also, monthly goals, the first Friday's devotion. Maybe 2019, you said, you know what, I haven't done the first Fridays. This is the year I'm going to do the first Fridays or the first Saturdays, which are five. This is the year I'm going to do the first Saturdays where you go to confession, you go to mass and pray the intentions for those first uh, nine or the first five for Our Lady. So those are good monthly goals. And then the annual goal, if you read the old manuals, the old spiritual directors, they say annually you need a spiritual retreat or a pilgrimage. Spiritual retreat or a pilgrimage. Pilgrimage doesn't mean you need to walk to Jerusalem on your in your bare feet. It could be a local pilgrimage. It could be a pilgrimage to a monastery, or it could be a pilgrimage to Lourdes or Fatima or Rome or Jerusalem, uh, Santiago in Spain. But to do a pilgrimage, something big that year, or a spiritual retreat, you know, sign up at a local Carmelite or Franciscan retreat house. Make sure there's good priests. Make sure you're going to get a good a good uh, recollection and a good retreat and spend a weekend with our Lord reviewing the year. That's ultimately the purpose. You want to review the past year. What am I doing well? Lord, how have you improved me? Lord, what am I not doing so well? How can I grow closer to Jesus this next year? I really think that that retreat should be an end of year kind of a thing. Maybe it's a November or December. You could do it in November because the liturgical year begins at Advent. Or you could do it December and begin it with January 1 with the civil new year. But to take everything we've talked about today and to not just, you know, watch a YouTube video and forget about it, but to get out a sheet of paper and get out a pencil 
and get with our Lord. And maybe, you know, you haven't planned, you can't do a, a retreat this year. No big deal. Maybe take 30 minutes right now or tonight, get a sheet of paper and say, I'm going to work out a goal plan for this year, for 2019. And I'm going to pray the rosary every day. And I'm going to read the Bible every day. And I'm going to go to confession every two weeks or every month. And I'm going to work in maybe the first Fridays. Maybe I'll do, I won't worry about the first Saturdays, but this year I'm going to do first Fridays. And I'm going to grow close to the sacred heart of Jesus in 2019. So there it is, goals, folks. You got to lay down those goals. I'm going to close up this video. I'm going to run a video about our uh, biblical studies program. I'm really excited in 2019 about the Christ in the Old Testament Catholic curriculum. So if you'd like to join us in the, if you're already in the New St. Thomas Institute, you're going to get it, right? Bonus thrown in, you've got it. Don't worry about it. But if you've never been part of the New St. Thomas Institute, join us, try it out. Uh, you're going to like it and you can start January 1st or whenever you see this, January 10th, it's never too late or February 10th or March 10th, whenever you see this, you can start working your way through the Bible and you're going to have online video commentary and audio commentary with me and others helping you answering your questions all year long. It's a great, great offer. I hope you'll take it up. And also don't forget in the show notes, you've got that uh, daily Bible reading outline for the whole year coming up. So as I always end, pray the rosary every day. This is going to be a crazy year. We don't know what's going to happen with the Pope. We don't know what's going to happen with the cardinals, the archbishops, the bishops, the USCCB. Are there going to be more surprises? Vigano, a new Vigano, more revelations? We don't know. Don't be reactive. Don't wait until it happens and whenever, June. Now what are we going to do? No, you have a game plan starting today. The game plan is you're talking to Jesus every day in the Bible, reading the Bible. You are communing with Jesus and living in the gospel every day through the rosary. Your sins are just being washed away all the time in the Eucharist and in confession, right? You are taking those retreats. You are at Eucharist adoration. You are really throwing nuclear weapons at the devil and his minions by being proactive, and having those goals every day. So I hope 2019 is a new watermark year. I hope this is the year that you look back 10, 20 years from now and say, that was it, 2019. I got out the sheet of paper, I got the pencil, and I made a game plan, and it changed me, changed my family, changed those around me. It brought people to Jesus Christ. It made me into a saint because I got serious with those goals. Thomas Aquinas, your final goal is the beatific vision. Now, go out there and get a bunch of other goals to get you to that goal. All right. Well, Happy New Year, everyone. Uh, January 1st, the Feast of the Circumcision, also the Feast of the Mother of God. May she be with us in this next year. And remember that our Lord Jesus Christ said that you are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So go out there and be salty. Happy New Year. God bless. Peace with all of you. Have you ever said, I'm gonna read the entire Bible? Almost every Christian at some point in their lifetime commits to reading the entire Bible. They begin with Genesis, they go to Exodus, and by the time they get to Leviticus, they begin to peter out. Why is that? Because as you get into a lot of the minutia, numbers, codes, rules, and rituals, you begin to lose focus of what the Bible's about. And as Catholic Christians, we believe the Bible is about our Lord Jesus Christ. St. Augustine of Hippo, the great doctor of the church, once wrote, The New Testament lies hidden in the Old, and the Old Testament is unveiled in the New. St. Augustine is telling us that unless we read the Old Testament through the lens of Christ in the New Testament, we're going to miss the point. And so what we've done in the New St. Thomas Institute is create an entire curriculum and course on the Old Testament but it's Christ in the Old Testament. So we're gonna show you how the patriarchs, the sacrifice, the temple, the prophets, each and every element throughout the Old Testament points to Jesus Christ and the sacraments and the church and baptism and everything that we hold as Christians in the New Testament. It's hidden right there in the Old. 
This new Old Testament study in the New St. Thomas Institute is not just a survey course. What we're doing is we're showing you the theology of typology, the new hidden in the old. So if you want to get excited about the Old Testament, you want to make your way all the way through the Bible, this course will help provide a commentary as you move along book by book. You can either read the whole Old Testament as you take the classes or just take the classes and glean the riches of the church fathers as they comment on the Old Testament in light of the new. So if you haven't already joined the New St. Thomas Institute, sign up and receive this Old Testament studies course as well as our New Testament study course and six other curricula on Catholic apologetics and theology. Sign up for the New St. Thomas Institute today and become a confident Catholic.